Shout out to everyone who's already online, already part of our webinar. We'll wait a couple more minutes for everyone to join. Thank you for being here on time already. a couple more minutes and we'll start when we have more people joining us already looking good everyone's already here just waiting for a couple more attendees Say one more minute and uh, we'll start our event. All right, I think everyone's ready to go, then we should go and uh, yeah, more people will also keep joining, but I'll just start this out for, for now. Um, hello everyone, welcome everyone, welcome uh, Ms. Kemma, welcome uh, Dr. Valas, uh, Mr. Schindler, uh, Professor Farid, and also welcome to my colleague uh, Johannes. It's very great that you're all here today. I'm Nawal Siman, I am the policy advisor of the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung for Counterterrorism, and together with Johannes Wegen, the um, policy advisor at CAS for Cybersecurity, we'll be hosting this event today. Um, we are launching and presenting today our study on the threats of deepfakes on democracy and society, um, a topic that is very relevant and also very timely today, thinking of things like the upcoming US presidential elections and also seeing what happens concerning fake news and disinformation throughout the times of Corona, really. The publication we're launching today is a common project of the Konrad Adenauer Foundation and the Counter Extremism Project Germany. The authors are here with us today. It's Professor Hani Farid. Um, he's in Berkeley right now, and it's Dr. Hans Jakob Schindler in Berlin. Um, and we also today, I'm really happy to have um, Ronja Kemmer with us today, a member of the German Bundestag. And of course, our Deputy, Deputy Secretary General, Dr. Wallers. Very happy to have you all. This event is being recorded um, as an information for all of you. And you may have noticed your microphones are muted, your videos are turned off. You do have the opportunity, however, to ask questions. We would really much like to um, see all your questions so we can answer them and start a discussion with you. Please do so in the Q&A section. You have the option to do this anonymously if you want to, and we will go through them and filter your questions and uh, see that we can answer as many of them as we can in the Q&A in the end. Um, please always direct your questions to a specific person. Unfortunately, uh, Ms. Kemma will not be able to join the discussion later on, but um, Dr. Schindler will be available as also a policy expert. So if you have any policy specific questions for also Germany, feel free to um, address him directly. Um, yeah, and if you, if you want, also state your affiliation if you ask questions, so we kind of know um, what's happening, but feel free to do that however you like. Um, yeah. Basically, I would just like to start out really give the word to our Deputy Secretary General, Dr. Valas, uh, who's with us tonight and who will say some words to all of you. Yeah, thank you very much, um, uh, Ms. Seaman. Uh, I would like to welcome uh, as well everybody who is now online uh, listening in to, to this uh, program specifically. I would like to welcome uh, the Member of Parliament, uh, Ronya. Uh, Kemmer, who is uh, an expert 
Uh, she's spokesperson on the CDU-CSU side for artificial uh, intelligence. And, and uh, um, some of you might know that um, this week is the last week where the uh, Bundestag is in session. So it is a very, very busy week. And I feel uh, specifically privileged, uh, Madam uh, Kemmer, that you are joining us uh, this, uh, this afternoon. Um, I would as well welcome a, a delegation, uh, we, a virtual delegation we invited um, from, from countries like US, Ukraine, Bulgaria, Romania, Kosovo, Chile. Uh, they are all experts on, on uh, questions of disinformation. I talked to them on, on Friday and uh, this delegation as well is accompanying us in this, uh, in this uh, endeavor. Um, when I met uh, Jakob Schindler and, and, and uh, Henny Farid uh, a year ago or so in, in my office, uh, they, they showed me some examples of what it is, what it means, uh, deep fake. And, uh, and I tell you, I was, I was puzzled. Um, twofold, I might say. One thing that it was, uh, it was, it is really, really very, very difficult to uh, decipher what is, what is fake and what is not fake, what is reality and, and, and what is not. So um, uh, the degree of sophistication uh, in the meantime is, is, is very, very high. And, but, but what puzzled me even more is the fact that it seems that to to have these very sophisticated deep fake, uh, you, uh, you, you are able to do so without really acquiring a lot of knowledge. So you have the fact that on the, on the one hand, you have a very sophisticated product, but this sophisticated product is able to be produced by a relatively large uh, group uh, of people. And, and this uh, will definitely have some consequences. We'll have consequences not only with regard to the personalities that might be targeted, but will as well have consequences for, for our, um, our society, for our institutions. If you don't know, is that real? Is that not real? If it is very, very difficult to respond, if the time, the time lag between seeing the, the, the news, seeing the fake news, and then uh, uh, the time to respond is, is, is not immediately, and, and you can't do, and you, cannot, you are not able to do so uh, in an uh, uh, appropriate way, then uh, it is not only a question of, uh, of one fake news or of uh, one phenomena, but it really uh, uh, can, um, uh, destabilize a, a whole uh, system. And that is something I think um, uh, we, should be, we should be very, very uh, puzzled about. And, and, and when I saw that, um, uh, Professor Farid, uh, Jakob Schindler, and, and, and uh, we at the Adenauer Foundation, uh, we, we thought in, in doing a study to go a little bit deeper into the, into the facts and, uh, uh, you know, after after uh, a year, uh, the, the results the, uh, are now uh, to be shown. And I'm, I'm absolutely sure that it will be uh, not only a fascinating uh, uh, presentation, but that we will have a very, very interesting uh, discussions. I'm looking forward to the comments of Member of Parliament, Rania uh, Kemmer, and uh, there will be time enough as well to discuss uh, the results of the study. So I wish us all a very, very uh, interesting uh, afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you a lot, Dr. Valas. Thank you for your first words. Um, I'm very happy to now also have Dr. Hans Jakob Schindler with us today, the Senior Director of CEP Germany, Counter Extremism Project Germany. He co-authored the study we're launching today and especially contributed to the policy parts of it. So I'm very happy to, to hear him now for a couple of minutes and his input later, of course. Thank you very much. Uh, just one second while I share my screen in a 
very present at, uh, attempt to promote our work. Um, there you go, and slideshow, and we can start there you go. I hope you can see all the slides. Uh, so thank you so much for the opportunity to introduce the Counter Extremism Project today. I'm particularly grateful for the wonderful cooperation that we at CEP have with the Konrad Adenauer Foundation, including during the production of this report, as well as the organization of this launch event. The Counter Extremism Project has developed a particularly close working relationship with the foundation, both here in Berlin, as well as with its office uh, of the foundation in New York. And I'm proud that today we are able to present the first major report that was developed through this cooperation. Let me begin with a short summary of what the Counter Extremism Project is and what we do. The Counter Extremism Project, CEP, is a transatlantic organization that was founded in 2014. And we work both in North America as well as in Europe against all forms of extremism, from right wing violent extremism all the way to Islamist terrorism. The organization has its headquarters in New York, but also representatives and advisors in Washington, D.C., Brussels, London, and Paris. Um, since October 2019, however, we also have a permanent office in Berlin, as well as a separate legal entity, CEP Germany. We broadly follow three work streams. First, we work on counterterrorism issues, including the combating of financing of terrorism. And during the last two years, we have established a particular expertise on the misuse of cryptocurrencies by both extremist and terrorist organizations. In May, we published a report on this subject in cooperation with Berlin Risk and have taken part in the ongoing public consultations of the European Union concerning a new regulatory framework for crypto values. Secondly, we work on countering violent extremism and preventing violent extremism uh, uh, issues. Here, the CEP has developed a particular expertise in rehabilitation programs for released terrorist offenders and has published major reports on the rehabilitation programs in the US in cooperation with our US partner Parallel Networks and the report on such programs in Germany in cooperation with Dr. Pelzer of the Technical University of Berlin. On this issue, we're also working together with the Radicalization Awareness Network RAN of the European Union. And finally, we work on disrupting the misuse of internet and social media applications by extremist and terrorist groups. Here, CEP has worked in support both of the Netzwerk Durchsetzungsgesetz, Network Enforcement at NETS EG in Germany, as well as the Planned Terrorist Content Online Regulation, PCO, of the European Union, and has over the last three years published a range of reports and studies on these issues, highlighting the misuse and suggesting effective and efficient regulations. It is within this work stream that the idea for the current report developed. Deep fakes are a particularly complex threat when they are misused for political manipulation. And as our report highlights, the capability to deploy deep fake technology is no longer limited to those with access to significant computational power. And therefore, both malign state as well as non-state actors have increasingly the ability to misuse this technology. Furthermore, the technology has now advanced to a level that it's nearly impossible for the unsuspecting user to recognize deep fake video without the use of sophisticated technologies, risking significant political and societal disruption if this technology is employed as part of a coordinated, targeted, and widespread dis or misinformation campaign. Therefore, analyzing the weaponization of deep fake technology for nefarious purpose fits neatly within the core area of CEP's activities and CEP's ability to work on both sides of the Atlantic gives us a unique perspective on this emerging threat. As you will see from our report, the misuse of deep fakes uh, for political manipulation is currently more prevalent in the United States than in Germany. Therefore, luckily, there is still time to strengthen the defenses against such mis misuse in Germany. And the report recommends a multi-layered approach including legal and technical measures, as well as increasing social media literacy in Germany. I'm very honored that CEP's senior advisor, Professor Dr. Hani Farid of the University of California, Berkeley, who is one of the world's leading expert, experts on digital forensic, was able to be the lead author of this report uh, that is going to be presented today. And I'm very much looking forward to his presentation. Thank you very much and uh, looking forward to the discussion with you. Thank you, Dr. Schindler. Um, also, we at Konrad Adenauer Stiftung are very happy to be cooperating with you. And I think we really managed to uh, 
make a great report here that we are happy to present today. And yeah, so now we're going to get to the main part of this event. Really where Professor Hanifana um, is going to present the study that he, that he authored together with, with Dr. Schindler. And as Dr. Schindler just said, Professor Hani Farid is the global leader in digital forensics. So very happy to have him here. Um, he's been able to identify many deep fakes in his career. He had some influences really with uh, many things he, he did in his work before. And uh, yeah, next to being a professor at the University of Berkeley, he's a senior advisor at CEP. And um, of course, we're happy to have him as a partner in the study. So I'm very happy to hear from him directly now about this new study that will be published on our website tonight, right after this event. And yeah, I'm happy to hear what he has to tell us. Good morning. Thank you very much. And thanks for having me. Um, I'm happy to spend a little time talking with you today about the creation weaponization and detection of deep fakes. So I think it's first important to understand that deep fakes is really only the latest uh, incarnation of manipulating digital media. If we go back to the beginning of photography, we have been manipulating images. Now, of course, since the digital age started in the early 1990s, things have changed in terms of complexity and sophistication and reach. And I wanted to start first by talking about the history of digital tampering, and then we'll get into deep fakes. So if you look through this 25 year period from the uh, early 1990s to a few years ago, really the growth and the explosion of digital media and the internet, you saw an increasing sophistication of the ability to manipulate digital images and video. And um, for a long time, we've been able to do things like this, you know, really fun. We can take two heads and swap them in, 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 in an image. And you needed something like a Photoshop and a little bit of skill and a little bit of time to do something like this. And we could do things like this as well, replace one person's face with another person's face. And we've been able to do this now for a few years and, um, and, and they're, they're funny and, and, um, and, and, and bring us some humor. And we've also been able to uh, more recently manipulate video. So let's go ahead and just watch this video. I appreciate the tenor of the conversations. Uh, I think it will actually yield results uh, before the end of the year, and I look forward to continuing this dialogue in the months ahead. Thank you very much, everybody. I have to say, every time I see that, I want that video to be true. Uh, so this was a YouTube, uh, a YouTuber made this video. Um, of course, it's President Obama up until he starts walking and then it was just spliced with the body double to kick the door down. So again, required some software and some skill and some time and some effort, but we've been able to manipulate images and video uh, to make it seem like people have said and, and done things that they have not done for quite a long time now. And for that 25 year period from 1990 to 2015, um, I've been thinking a lot about how you authenticate that type of content. And the way we think about this type of forensic uh, authentication is to think about the imaging pipeline. So what happens with the physics of the world? What happens when that light enters the lens and makes its way through an optical train and eventually hits a sensor, gets recorded uh, from a, a light into a digital signal gets packaged into typically a JPEG image, gets put into Photoshop or After Effects, and then ends up in Facebook or YouTube or Twitter. And through that life of the light, as it starts in the world and ends up into a digital image, a lot of very interesting things happen that you can mathematically model and then look for inconsistencies. And the field of forensics for many, many years, for decades really, has been focused on this imaging pipeline to authenticate content, and we have gotten fairly good at it. But something very dramatic happened about four or five years ago with the explosion of artificial intelligence and more particularly machine learning and deep learning. Um, and that's what has led to the sort of the newest revolution of deep fakes, which we're going to talk about now. So this revolution of deep neural networks is really taking technology from the 1960s neural networks and the 1980s. And because of the power of computing and because massive data sets and of course innovations in the underlying mathematics, 
we've been able to train computer systems, neural networks, to do really remarkable things. And some of those things have led to great innovations, and some have le led to mixed innovations, and that's what we're going to talk about now. So if you navigate to the website, thispersondoesnotexist.com, um, you will be presented with an image of a person, and it will look like one of these six images that you see here. And these people, true to the name of the webpage, don't exist. They were completely 100% synthesized by a computer algorithm, and in particular, a deep neural network that I'm going to describe to you in a little bit. And you can see here that these people are highly realistic. They cross races, they cross genders, they cross age, they have glasses, uh, they have earrings, they have facial hair and they look highly realistic. And in fact, these images have been used to create fraudulent um, LinkedIn profiles and Twitter profiles to, uh, uh, for, for purposes of fraud and sometimes just for good practical jokes. And so what I wanna do now um, with this as the backdrop is to talk about how these are created and then we'll talk about where we see the threats and then I'll talk some more about how we detect those. So here's the basic infrastructure for creating an image of a person who doesn't exist. There are two main components, a generator shown here on the left and a discriminator shown in the bottom right. So what the generator does is it starts with a random image. And when I say random, I mean, truly mean random. You literally put random pixels as you see in the top here and you pass that image to a discriminator. And the only thing the discriminator has at its disposal are images of people. Okay. Not anyone in particular, just here's a bunch of faces, which of course, now there's millions, tens of millions, billions of those available. And the discriminator is asked, can you distinguish this image here, which was created by the generator, from these images here, real people? And of course, the answer is sure, I can tell the difference between those. So it goes back to the generator and it says, try again. And the generator modifies some pixels, sends that to the discriminator, the discriminator checks again, goes back. And this very tight loop happens millions and millions and millions of times very, very quickly. And eventually what happens is the generator modifies the image in a way that when it's sent to the discriminator, it looks like a person. This is a so-called generative adversarial network. Generative because it generates something. Adversarial because there's two systems that are fighting each other. Right? The generator is trying to fool the discriminator and the discriminator is trying to tell the difference. And network, because underneath these two blue boxes here is a deep neural network. So these are so-called GANs, generative adversarial networks. And notice here that the user doesn't really have to do anything. All the user has to do is provide images of people, just provide the data. Algorithmically, computationally, there's no Photoshop, there's no computer generated imagery, there's no skill, there's no talent. You simply let the computer figure out what's real and what's not. And therein lies the power of these types of deep fakes. Now you can use the same uh, GAN structure, generative adversarial network, to not just create an image of a person, but to change the identity of a person. So imagine I start with one frame of the, uh, the actress Jennifer Lawrence here, and I wanna change her face to be that of another actor, Steve Buscemi. Okay? And you'll see in a minute why I'm picking these two performers. So again, the generator modifies this image, sends it to the discriminator. The discriminator now has not images of random people, but of just one person, Steve Buscemi. And now its job is to say, can you distinguish this person from this person? And if the answer is yes, then it goes back to the generator and it tries again and it works in a very tight loop again in this adversarial way. And eventually the face here will be modified to be the face of whomever you put here. And the result of this is a so-called face swap deep fake. And let me show you the result of that video. Expected Amy to win. So I, I just like, it was just, I, this, was, this was very truly surprising for me. Uh, okay, so what are you seeing? On the left is the original Jennifer Lawrence accepting an award, and on the right is the result of a face swap deep fake, where on every frame, frame by frame by frame, at 30 frames per second, Steve Buscemi's face has been replaced with Jennifer Lawrence, and again, fully automatic. All you have to do as the forger is provide images of the person that you want, and then you let the code run, 
frame after frame after frame after frame. So now you can start to see, now obviously this video is meant to be fun. It's not meant to fool anybody. Nobody thinks this is Steve Buscemi in a dress and a necklace with blonde hair, nothing an award. So, but you can now see the power of this type of technology. Now this is one type of uh, deep fake called a face swap because I'm swapping the face from the eyebrows to the chin. Let me show you a different type of deep fake and then we'll talk about how it was created. Now, you see, I remember saying these things. At least not in a public address, but someone else would. Someone like Jordan Peele. This is a dangerous time. Moving forward, we need to be more vigilant with what we trust from the internet. Okay, and I realize it's a little disorienting what you're seeing here. Um, on the left is uh, an original video of uh, President Obama, but what you're hearing is Jordan Peele speaking as if he was Obama. And here now, instead of replacing the entire face from the eyebrows to the chin, all the, 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 the GAN, the Generative Adversarial Network learned is to replace the mouth to be consistent with the new audio track. So a slightly different uh, process. Now it has to say, what does the mouth look like to be consistent with this sound, hence the lip sync. So now you can see the real power of this technology. I can literally put words into the mouth of a president or a candidate or just about anybody else, as long as I can impersonate or synthesize their voice. So those are the image and video types of deep fakes. And now let, and I've described very briefly how they're created. So now let me talk about where is the threat? Where, what are we worried about? So if you look now on in the landscape, the most dominant use of this type of deep fake technology is in the form of non-consensual pornography, where one person's likeness is inserted into a sexually explicit uh, material, and then that, of course, is distributed on the internet. So that can take the form of performers, people like Jennifer Lawrence. It can take the, the form of investigative journalists, human rights investigators who um, um, anger people, and then they use this as a weapon against women and the, again, the dominant form of this is particularly against women is in the form of this type of material, which is particularly damaging um, to in, at a very individual level. Now, obviously, I think everybody can see the damage that this type of uh, content can create for misinformation campaigns. The may, imagine now that we go from what was traditionally considered misinformation or disinformation or fake news um, where it's simply an article or a tweet. And now you have a video of somebody saying whatever you need them to say to bolster that misinformation, very powerful. I have always for the last 20 years working in the space of digital forensics worried about evidence tampering. Um, more than ever, we are relying on digital evidence um, for everything to deal with police misconduct to human rights violations. Um, to crimes committed on the streets of our cities and towns. Um, and what happens when we can't trust the police body cam or the citizen journalist or the CCTV that's recording it? What happens when we don't trust digital content anymore because we know things can be manipulated? I don't think it takes a stretch of the imagination to think about how this can be a threat to national security. Uh, what happens if a video of one world leader saying, I've launched nuclear weapons against another uh, releases on YouTube or Twitter, and we have seconds, minutes to respond. I don't think that's likely, but it's also not impossible, and that should concern us a great deal. Um, we are, of course, worried about fraud, and we have been seeing deep fakes being used to commit fraud. Imagine the following scenario. Imagine I create a deep fake, either a face swap or a lip sync of Mark Zuckerberg uh, privately saying Facebook stock is down 20%. How quickly can I release that and move the market to the tune of billions of dollars? And so from non-consensual pornography on a very individual level to misinformation campaigns on a societal level to evidence tampering at a judicial level, national security at a global level and fraud at an economic level, we are concerned with what happens when we enter an age when images, videos and audios can be relatively easily manipulated and distributed and believed. Where are we as a society, as individuals, and as a democracy? And that's the landscape that we see going forward. 
I don't think that the deep fake technology is so advanced at this particular moment, but it is happening. And as Dr. Schindler said, we can get ahead of this if we look forward a little bit in time and not simply wait for the technology to get there and then try to react very quickly. So what I'd like to do now is talk a little bit about how we are working to detect these types of deep fakes. And then at the very end, I will talk a little bit about interventions. So I'm gonna talk about two different techniques that we are working on. Let me start by playing you a series of video clips of President Obama. And please see if you notice anything, pay attention to the way he's speaking. Hi everybody, 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 hi everybody. Hi everybody, hi everybody, hi everybody. Okay, so those are all separate video clips of President Obama at the beginning of his weekly address when he was at the White House. And you probably noticed that every time he began to speak, he said, hi everybody, and he lifted his head up and to the right. It was, hi everybody. And what you may not have noticed, but you can see right here is as he comes down, he purses his lips and then he begins to speak. And it's a very consistent, mannerism or behavioral behavior that he has. And we all have them when we speak, how we raise our eyebrow when we emphasize a word, how we lean in a little bit when we wanna make a point. And what we are in the business of doing, we call these soft biometrics. Biometrics because they're like fingerprint, uh, DNA, iris, uh, but soft because they don't necessarily distinguish you from seven billion people in the world, but might be able to distinguish you from somebody who is, is an imposter. So by way of an example, let's look at this. Um, this on top is one frame of an authentic video. And this graph here that I'm showing you in blue is the amount that President Obama is rotating his head up and down. So that's rotation around the x-axis. And orange is how he, the sides of his mouth are turned down as if he's frowning. And these are averaged over hours of video. What do you notice? You notice that they're correlated. So when his head turns down, he frowns. And when he turns up, he tends to smile. And you see this when President Obama speaks, when he delivers bad news, when he's angry, when he's upset, he tends to look down ever so slightly and the sides of his mouth turn down a little bit. And it's a, it's a mannerism, it's a behavior that he has. Now on the bottom here is a, is a, a one frame of a lip sync deep fake. So that's like the Jordan Peele video that I showed you earlier. And here you can see that that pattern that we see in the authentic videos is broken. Why? Because now the mouth is saying something, it, whatever was in the original video. So the mouth is talking, sorry, the head is talking, but the mouth has been synthesized by a computer to say something else. It doesn't know what the head is saying. And so the mouth is talking, the head is talking, but they're no longer synchronized with each other. And that's why you see this pattern here. Okay. Now that's President Obama's mannerism or behavioral tick. Different people have different things. So here is, again, time here. And in blue is this chin pucker that President Trump is known to do. And in orange is the wide open mouth, also what he's known to do. And you can see here now that they're decorrelated. So when his mouth is closed, he chin puckers. And when his mouth is open, he does not chin pucker. Now down here is a face swap deep fake where we took Alec Baldwin, the actor from Saturday Night Live, the comedy show, and we spliced in Trump's face on top of that. And here you see that Alec Baldwin didn't quite get it right. So here you can see that when Baldwin does the chin pucker, his mouth is open. That's not the way, that's not the right mannerism. So he got the two pieces right, but he didn't put them together right, right? Okay. So this is the pattern of mannerisms and behavior we're going to exploit. And let me just show you how we're gonna do that very quickly. We take a video as input and we track the head and the face over time. The blue box tells me how the head is rotating. The green uh, lines coming out of the eyes tell me where he's looking. And all of the red dots track uh, the eye position and the cheek and the mouth over time. We take all of that information and we extract 20 measurements, so-called action units how you're raising your eyebrows, how you're frowning, how you're opening your mouth, and so on and so forth. And then we look at all of the correlations, which gives me 190 measurements over time. Okay? Now, I can't visualize things in 190 dimensional space. We really can only visualize in a three to four dimensional space. But I'm gonna take that very high dimensional data and I'm going to project it onto a two dimensional surface 
my computer screen. Each dot that you see here corresponds to a 10 second video clip of President Obama, Kamala Harris, Hillary Clinton, Elizabeth Warren, Cory Booker, and so on and so forth. So you can see that this was done at the height of the Democratic primary. And you see something very interesting. Each person, Obama, Warren, Sanders, Trump, is in a different area of the space and they're highly coupled. That is, we find patterns that are highly consistent for an individual and distinct from other individuals. And so once we build this representation that you see here, we simply take a new video, we track the face, we extract the measurements, we project into the space and we ask, does it look like Obama? Does it look like Warren? Does it look like Clinton? Does it look like Harris and so on and so forth? And in that way, we can use the behavioral mannerisms to distinguish whether somebody is impersonating somebody or not. All right, let me talk about technique number two. Um, these are so-called vizim phoneme mappings. So phonemes are the sounds that you make when you say certain words. So for example, down here in the bottom left corner, when you say mother, brother, or parent, M-B-P, you will notice, you can try this at home. Everybody's mic is muted, so I won't hear you. You can try this at home. Um, say mother, brother, parent, and you will find that your mouth has to close. Now try saying it without your mouth closing, other. Uh, it's very, very hard to enunciate that particular word, at least in English. And so we are going to use these constraints on the shape of the mouth and the sounds that you make to detect lip sync deep fakes, where the mouth is being synthesized to be consistent with the audio. So let me give you an example of this. I'm going to play you a slow motion video of President Trump saying, I am. I'm, I'm. Okay, so go ahead and listen. I'm, 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 I'm. And notice at the very end, his mouth closes. And just to convince you of that, I'm going to walk you through those six frames. So one, two, three, four, five, and six. And his mouth closes. That's an authentic I'm. His mouth is closing to say I am. Now, here he is saying it again, but this is a lip sync deep fake. So go ahead and listen. Okay, so you also hear an S at the end. I'm, so I'm bringing you into the next word so you can hear that I've driven you through the M. Okay, so I'm, so I'm, and now let's look at the frames. One, two, three, and now he's starting to say S and his mouth doesn't close, okay? And so what we find is in about half of the lip sync deep fakes that we've detected, just this one phoneme to visine mapping is wrong. And now we go after the different Vizim phony mapping and eventually we will find in the lip sync deep fakes where the mouth has not been properly formed. Now, very hard for you to detect this, by the way, because the video is going at 30 frames a second very, very fast, but obviously computationally we can detect it. Now, let me show you one more that we're working on because I think it's particularly interesting to see this. I'm gonna play you two videos of President Obama. One is real, one is fake. See if you can tell the difference. Hi, everybody. On the first day of my administration, I promised to restore science to its rightful place. I told you we would unleash American innovation and technology to tackle the health challenges of our time. Okay, first video. Now watch the second video. Hi, everybody. On the first day of my administration, I promised to restore science to its rightful place. I told you we would unleash American innovation and technology to tackle the health challenges of our time. Okay. Uh, most people, you, you, can, you can vote, number one or number two. Uh, number one is real and number two is fake. And most people can detect this because there is something wrong. And notice, all you can't see his mouth, of course. All you can see is here, but there's something with the, the way you're, what you're saying and how you're saying it and how you move that are correlated. And those get violated when you create lip sync deep fakes in the same way that I showed you earlier. Okay, so those are three techniques that we've been working on to detect deep fakes. So now let me talk about intervention. So obviously we need technology number three here. We need to develop, if we're gonna develop technology to create these things, and we can talk about whether we should or not, then surely we should be working to develop technology to detect them. I think that's clear. But going up to the top again, no matter how good my technology is, if the platforms that are distributing this content 
simply say we are not responsible for misinformation meant to suppress voters. We are not responsible for misinformation meant to harm women in the form of non-consensual pornography or disrupt elections or commit fraud. Well, then we can have the best technology in the world. But if Mark Zuckerberg says, this is not my problem, I don't have a problem with this material, then we have a huge problem. So corporations and in particular social media have to take responsibility for how their platforms are being weaponized. At the end of the day, the deep fakes are a threat, not just because they have democratized access to technology that can manipulate media, but they're a threat because I can also distribute that content to the tune of millions of people almost instantaneously through social media. So we have to start holding our social media platforms, Facebook and Twitter and YouTube and TikTok and so on and so forth, more responsible for taking down content that is harmful or at least limiting the reach. Now, in terms of regulation here in the US, but abroad, there is a very vigorous and there should be a vigorous debate about free speech. Should we have the right to do this or not? I would, and we should have that debate, but I, should all, I also argue we should have a debate also about reach. What you have to understand about social media is that it's not just that you can push speech, images, video, audio, text onto the internet, but it's that then social media tells uh, users to read, to read that or, or, to, or to watch that content. So you may, we can argue whether you have a right to say whatever you want online, but surely we can agree you don't have a right for that private company to spread that lie to the tune of millions and tens of millions of people. The problem with social media today is that it makes its business, its profit, its billions of dollars off of hate, divisiveness, conspiratorial, outrageous, and sensational, because they know that those are the things that engage users. They don't make their money off of thoughtful debate, uh, educational content. And so we, can, we should have, again, that vigorous debate about speech, but we should have a serious conversation about how social media is radicalizing people around the world. And I think that's the place where that algorithmic amplification has to have, we have to have serious conversations. I've already talked about technology, and of course we have to have education. Of course we have to educate the next generation of digital citizens to be critical, to think about how they digest content online, to think about how they engage with this content online, because not only can we create this fake content, not only is social media allowing me to distribute it, but then we have people who are spreading it by sharing and liking and retweeting. And we have to look at all aspects of that, the creation, the distribution, and then the spreading of it to get a handle on the misinformation that is propagating through our networks. Finally, I'll say um, all the tech, most of the techniques that I've described and some others are available on my website here at fareed.berkeley.edu. You'll find many, many technical papers and interviews that I've done over the, the last few years on this topic if you're interested in reading more. And with that, I'll stop and turn it back over to our moderator. Thank you so much, Hani. That was great. Um, and this is basically what the publication is about. And uh, you can read them right after this event when it's published. Now I'm very happy to have uh, Mrs. Kemma here with us today. Um, I'm very happy to have you here. You have been a member of the German Bundestag since 2013. And you are the chairwoman of the Parliament's Committee on Artificial Intelligence. So I'm very happy to hear your take on this, uh, this whole issue and also especially to hear your take on the German context and the European context of this all. Yeah, so thank you very much, um, dear ladies and gentlemen, or as Obama used to say, hi, everybody. <laughs> Thanks to Konrad Adenauer Foundation uh, for this event and also for uh, having me today. So maybe um, just a few words before going more into detail about the deepfake and uh, the political concerns we, we have about it. Um, let me just say a few words um, about uh, the digital transformation in general, because I think as we all probably know that it uh, yeah, changed and changes um, our everyday life. And of course also it changes the democratic processes. And I think on the one side we have seen like really, really great opportunities, especially when we think about um, free exchange of information that is not um, yeah, like a standard in many, many countries in the world. 
if we think about the uh, Arab Spring, but also about many other examples in the um, recent years, especially, of course, with, with concern to, to social media. But on the other side, and I think this is probably something quite normal, as with all techno technological developments we see, um, of course, that there is a downside, that there are risks, and of course, um, the opportunities of misinformation um, are growing. And also, if we talk about extremism, um, we see that radical networks, they can expand more easily, they can um, yeah, connect easier to, to different groups. And um, I think we see this for yeah, extremists from the right-wing spectrum, from the left-wing spectrum, but also um, from religious extremists. And um, if we see some developments, even before, I would say, deepfake, I think some of them are really concerning. So for me, and for us as a parliamentarian group, um, as CDU, CSU, but of course also for the, uh, for the foundation, it always has been a topic um, talking about, for example, um, anti-Semitic extremism. And just to give you like one number, and as I said, this is all uh, before um, technological development and deep fakes. We have seen in a, a study of the Technical University of Berlin that was done from 2007 to 2017, uh, to 2017 that anti-Semitic um, statements in the commentary sectors of uh, major German online newspapers have risen by the amount of four. And of course, this is not only like problems or developments um, that have effects on the, on the online world, but of course also on the offline world. And so I think, of course, talking about extremism and how we can um, prevent it in the analog world, we, we need good prevention uh, work. We have to really fought with all um, full force of the law but for me, I think we really, really also have to focus more on digital channels. And as I said, you cannot really like separate the analog world from the digital anymore. And uh, we can see that there are effects, um, just to mention like the really terrible terroristic attack in Halle. Uh, we have seen uh, just a yeah, few time ago and we see also that, I would say, new techniques like using algorithm-driven social bots or fake accounts, they also create moods, they create sentiments. And this, of course, can be um, amplified and then also absorbed by the, by the public on the street. So therefore, I want to really say thanks to the Conrad Adenauer Foundation and also to Hani Farid for this really, I think, important project um, with yeah with a special focus on combating extremism and really yeah looking on the the phenomena of deep fakes because i think it addresses a particularly relevant and really important topic so now talking about deep fakes i think we see that there have been new possibilities that arise um, using ai and using especially as it was mentioned before um, deep learning and neutral networks nowadays. So um, as I am a member of the uh, Enquete Commission or Study Commission on Artificial, Artificial Intelligence in the German Bundestag, um, we have been working on a lot of questions. And uh, of course, AI is like the digital transformation itself is like a topic that has effects um, uh, on like many, many uh, issues. But we also were discussing in a project a group speci especially on AI and media and for us it has really become clear as it just was, was stated before that um, the possibility of producing I would say um, even more realistic looking deep fakes and um, they are increasing and they um, are getting more spread. So for the production of deep fakes um, a general adver adversarial network the so-called Chen a certain type of deep learning is uh, often used. And before talking 
maybe a little bit more about the risks, especially for the demo democracy or democratic processes. Um, I want to state that, of course, technology always has a lot of uh, good opportunities. And I think um, this must not be forgotten before talking about the risks. So um, we see that many of the de developments we see nowadays, um, they come from the film and from the gaming industry. And uh, many of them, of course, rely on these techniques and these um, uh, technologies. So um, if you think about deep learning algorithms that uh, translate a script into a stayboard or compose film music, or design, of course, the virtual world um, of online games. Um, it's like I said, the, these industry really rely on these uh, technologies. And we can also think further, like um, think about, for example, um, creative communication um, of educational content. So if um, in the future, not a teacher might explain you the relativity, but Albert Einstein himself, of course, not himself, but as a as an AI uh, might explain you, like his um, uh, relativity theory, I think we see that there are a lot of good opportunities, of course. But on the other side, as I said, um, the technology is used, of course, for manipulative purposes, and this can really, really become um, problematic. And we've seen now a lot of examples just a couple of minutes ago. And there are like the really famous uh, first um, deep fakes videos um, about or of Obama and of um, Mark Zuckerberg as well. Um, uh, where Obama, for example, said that President Trump is a, dope, a total and complete dipshit. Um, and on the other side, um, also Zuckerberg that um, should be said uh, that he uh, wants to control like a billion of people's stolen data and so on. And especially the second one, I mean, it was a gag by an advert adversing uh, agency, but we see that this already got like a political dimension and these were like just the first stages of, um, uh, of deep fake videos. And of course, um, technology improves. So today in many cases, um, deep fakes are still detectable. And uh, we've also seen like um, a lot of examples uh, from this before. There are still some teething troubles left. Um, Professor Farid also um, said something about this. So if you think about the moving or the blinking of the eyes, um, the impre uh, imprecise geometry of the face at, uh, at its whole, but also um, of course, that it's always just done from a fr frontal view. It cannot, or nowadays, it's still difficult to do it like from a side view. Um, but we also see that, yeah, technology is really improving and that it's, uh, the tools are spreading faster and faster. And yeah, I think that soon almost everyone will be able to produce better deep fakes. And it will even get like every day more and more difficult to distinguish. Um, only visually between a real and a computer generated um, a video. And of course, the problem is that there are a lot of people working uh, to improve the technology, but on the other side, people working um, how to detect um, uh, the, the difference between a real and a computer generated video um, are really less than uh, the other ones. So we see that there um, is a kind of an unfair race, uh, I would say. So now talking maybe a little bit more about the political impact. We also have seen this like in political campaigns in the past and a really um, also like really a famous um, example is the case of Nancy Pelosi. And to say that um, it was not maybe really a, a deep fake. It was just a video that was a slowed down sli uh, slightly, but then uh, make it seem like she's drunk during a speech. And um, this already not being like a real deep fake, but being, yeah, real data put like in a false context, I would say. Um, this really was, yeah, like a reason for disinformation. And uh, we see that this really had already a uh, political impact. And now, 
we can imagine like various um, uh, different scenarios that even uh, lead to more. So perfection uh, of this technology might lead to even yeah, serious state crisis or even military conflicts um, um, in last case. So besides, I would say the really concrete situations of like certain videos and uh, impact they, they have and uh, or had and might have in the future, um, I think in general, we can also say that there is like a second um, harm or risk for, uh, for democracy. If we think about, yeah, paradigm shift um, uh, in the society and in the political um, uh, discourse. So we already have this nowadays, if we just think about the discussions we had in the last years talking about fake news. So, and really, uh, what is real and what is not real and to distinguish between that um, um, anymore. So I think um, in the future, like um, for every statement done by a politician, um, done but also from a businessman or from a, a scientist, there might also or always be the assumption like, okay, is this real or could it be a deep fake? And on the other side, like, um, if uh, someone just um, questions a video that indicates him or her, uh, incriminates him or her, we might see um, that it also uh, can be said like, okay, I, I haven't said this, this is just a deep fake. And so in general, we really, um, yeah, might be concerned or can be concerned about what this will do um, for us as a whole and as a society. So if nothing is considered reliable anymore. Um, Unfunkable uh, truths are easier to doubt and also trends, of course, like um, filter bubbles might also increase. And therefore, I think a really main political task or task also for us as a whole uh, society is that we have to be really careful um, that people do not resign and lose interest in really knowing about, is this now a real information or is this just a fake information? And fortunately, as also the study um, underlines, uh, we have now in Germany, no serious cases of deep fakes so far. But um, however, if you look in the, into the uh, United States and also um, Great Britain and other neighbor countries um, within the European Union, uh, Union, it might probably only be a matter of time. Um, before we um, are confronted with, uh, with this um, scenario as well. So, of course, this leads to the question, what can be political answer or answers? And what is also a concrete uh, discussed um, in, in German politics um, at the moment? So, I think we are already addressing the issue of deep fakes uh, in many different ways. The government discussed um, the issue in detail in the cabinet meeting last year in November 2019 in, in Meseberg. And uh, what is done now is a wide, I would say, interdepartmental uh, um, approach. So many um, different ministries um, yeah, concerning um, this topic. And uh, we see, for example, the Federal Foreign Office um, that is dealing with deep face under the leadership of the strategic communication steering group. Um, we also, of course, see the Ministry of Education and Research. And I think this is really we, something we have to expand um, that supports research projects really to identify and combat um, uh, um, yeah, disinformation and deep fakes. And furthermore, of course, also the Department of Cyber uh, and Information Security of the Federal Ministry of Interior uh, focuses on combating crime in connection with deep face, uh, deep fakes. So seeing the topic of media, especially of course, um, social media, um, it is very central for deep fakes. Deep fakes is they are the means to distribute deep fakes to an audience um, that we uh, yeah, really take more maybe that into concern. And we've done that with the network, a search act in, um, in the past already. But of course, we have maybe to do it now 
further also, and this is something that the study also addresses with regard to um, the spread and the dissemination of deep fakes. So we are currently working on the amendment of the NETS DG, and um, a simple point of this is, for example, that we are stipulating comparability and traceability in the transparency reports. Um, but also we want to, um, and finally, that reporting channels for illegal content also um, are improved, uh, which means they have to be more user friendly because we see that between the different platforms, it's yeah, there are really huge differences how user friendly in the uh, in the end these reporting channels are. Of course, this discussion I think will yeah will go on, and what for us is really really uh, important is that we find a balance. We want to uh, create uh, more security, and we want to set a high level of security standards, but we also, of course, want that um, uh, in the future that regulations are practicable. And as I said, that they are also user friendly. Um, but finally, and I can totally or totally agree with Professor Farid, we have to take um, uh, the platforms or the platforms have to take more responsibility um, to take down content that first of all, of course, is illegal, but also content that is manipulating uh, political dis discussions. It, it's not like, I think, acceptable that we uh, just uh, uh, think, okay, they are not responsible for anything. They are responsible. It's a business case for them. And so they really have to yeah, take more res responsibility in, in these cases. So finally, maybe talking about what are future demands and also future demands um, uh, of the study. Um, one example, of course, is that um, yeah, a ban on the use of certain deepfake software. I think this has to be or has to be discussed in the future. Um, um, of course, I cannot go into um, every detail uh, now, but I think we also have to find a balance and when it comes to regulation, it's really difficult, I would say, to um, yeah, divide from a scientific, but also from a technical point of view, um, the issue into harmless uh, and dangerous uh, components of the technology and those that we really want uh, to have. And um, we really have to take this technical point of view when it comes to um, political regulation. Because if we don't um, uh, yeah, take this really into account, we uh, might see discussions as we have seen them last year with the European Copyright Directive, where I at least think that the technological point of view was not taken enough uh, into, into account. So one last point I really want to highlight uh, from the study and one demand I, I really think is, is crucial for the future is that we have to improve digital literacy. Um, I think if we yeah, want to deal with the challenge of deep fakes, um, we have to really improve digital education and also um, beginning from an early age in, in school, I think. And uh, so now we um, have passed the Digital Park Schule. Um, we are investing 5 billion euros um, from the federal government um, for uh, improving the technology um, in schools. But of course, this has to, to um, go on. And I think that the role of a qualified, quali qualified uh, teachers here is very central. So we have to enable the teachers. Um, I think this is really crucial. And um, we also had already um, yeah, placed this uh, focus on that. Um, when it comes to the teacher training quality initiative, but there are further steps to take, not only for the federal government, but also um, yeah, for the lender. And um, as um, AI and education in general is concerned, I can announce that of course we, may, we will make some um, um, suggestions and recommendations uh, with the or uh, yeah, going on from the study commission 
um, with um, the uh, final report in autumn this year. And yeah, finally, I think if we talk about the role of Germany um, in the future within this discussion, I think, as I said before, we also have to expand um, the research activities, um, also the research field of media forensic in Germany. Um, and probably as Professor Farid can uh, confirm, the field of research in this um, area is yeah, not really um, like, like big or hasn't really also expanded uh, in the last year. So there's a lot of to do, I think. And this is also an opportunity, I think, for Germany um, in particular to uh, position itself, um, um, yeah, maybe in a leading role in, in this um, field. So, yeah, finally, I want again to say thank you uh, also to the foundation again, not only for this discussion, but yeah, for the work um, all over uh, the work all over the world. And yeah, unfortunately, I cannot join you for the discussion later, but really looking forward uh, for the next time. Thank you. Thank you so much for being uh, with us today, even though you have to leave now. Thank you so much for giving your input and uh, being with us. Thank you. So I will now. I will now uh, give the word to my colleague Johannes Wegen, who will start off with the first questions. Hi, I also from my side. I would like to start with the point that uh, Ms. Kemmer brought up, um, the so-called liars dividend. Um, everyone can claim that news that they don't like or that doesn't match their worldviews is fake. So how could this liar's dividend, this threat to society that nobody knows what's true can be uh, addressed? I think this is a great question, Johannes, um, and thank you for asking it. So first of all, as I enumerated, I think there are real threats to the actual fake content. But in many ways, the real threat going forward is the liar's dividend. And without being political about it, here in the US, we have a president who on a daily basis takes advantage of that and says, you can't believe this, you can't believe that, you can't believe this, simply demonizing the people that we disagree with. And that narrative, that method is first of all, not new. If you look through history, many, many uh, politicians took advantage of that. But now, when you in fact can manipulate images and audio and video, you have a reasonable case that can be made. And by the way, to give you a sense of how fast this has changed, 2015, then candidate Trump was caught on a tape saying some very awful things about women. Yeah, nobody thought to say it was fake at the time. That was just four or five years ago. Fast forward today, does anybody here think that we wouldn't have said it was fake? Of course they would have said it was fake and we would have moved on to the next thing. So I think you're absolutely right that when we fundamentally lose trust in what we read, see, hear online, I don't know how we have a society, I don't know how we have a democracy. If we can't have a shared factual system, we don't have democracy. And that is a real concern to me. And that concern comes from shallow fakes, deep fakes, misinformation, disinformation, and the social media platforms trafficking and profiting from that material because it's good for business as opposed to legitimate news sources and trusted news sources. Thank you, Hani. Um, so we're going to go in the, into the Q&A now. We have some questions there already. I'm going to try to summarize them a little bit uh, if I have to. So basically, the, one of the first questions is about the agenda setting of all of this. So how far is this topic already on the agenda? Is it there enough? I mean, we're talking about it today and we're talking about it now, but how much is this really being talked about? Too little, probably not too much. And also in this context, really, um, the question is, with the constant rise of deep fakes, with the rise of crime and extremism, um, how do you, sorry, just one question. What's the, one, one second. Yeah, sorry. So with the rise of all of that, 
can you predict the impact of deep fakes, deep fakes on things like the US election um, or any other big political events already? So I, I, I would not be comfortable predicting the impact of deep fakes specifically, but I would be reasonably comfortable to predict the role of misinformation and disinformation in our election mainly because in 2016, we saw that Russian interference changed our election. Here in the US, the difference between Trump and Clinton was 80,000 people in three states. Yeah, we know that on Facebook alone, hundreds of millions of people saw misinformation around the election and voting. So I don't think it takes a stretch of the imagination to believe that this will happen again. It's happening from outside interference, it's happening from the campaigns themselves. It's happening from individuals, organizations. Um, and so I am very concerned about the broad landscape of misinformation and disinformation around things like the upcoming election, around the Black Lives Matter movement, around COVID, where we have seen tremendous amounts of conspiracy and misinformation that is literally leading to the deaths of, of our citizens. I'm sure everybody knows here in the US, we have a huge outbreak in large part because there are just lies and misinformation on the internet that are telling people this is a conspiracy, that nothing is happening and we are dying as a consequence. So that landscape gives me real concern and I see the deep fakes as just an insertion to make that even worse than it already is. So while you were speaking, a question came up, I guess. So the question is, don't you think we exaggerate the impact of fake news and deep fakes? Um, I would assume you don't think so really. And also a question that kind of fits that is, could it be that politicians are beneficiaries or perpetrators of deep fakes? And how does that affect decision-making of electorates? So maybe you can just add on to what you just said a little bit. Good. So I, I don't know what you mean by exaggerate. Um, so for example, we have done studies to look at the impact of misinformation around the COVID crisis. And we find a troubling belief in things that are completely untrue, conspiracies, 5G uh, leads to COVID. There is no virus, this is a conspiracy. Those have deadly consequences to society to the tunes of hundreds of thousands of people dying. When you have misinformation that can change elections in a country of 350 million people, I don't think that's an exaggeration. And if you look, it's not just where we are today, but it's where are we going? If you look at the trend of how information has been weaponized over the last five years, the trend is dangerous. And I agree with you, it's not just Russian interference, Chinese interference, you know, countries trying to interfere with each other. It's the campaigns themselves. The Trump campaign is doing this on a daily basis. Um, his, his, we have Fox News here in this country that on a daily basis pushes out misinformation and disinformation. I think the reason you are seeing around COVID, around Black Lives Matter, around Trump, so much social discontent is because we are all living in a filter bubble on social media. We are all getting news that conforms to our worldview. Some of it is true, some of it is not, and it is literally tearing societies apart. I don't think that that's an exaggeration. It is something that I am very concerned about. Uh, I have another question. Um, what is the effect of deep fakes on the role of evidence in court? Especially do low income countries need support to develop techniques to detect their societies from deep fakes? Yeah. So I can only of course speak to the rules in the US, but I can tell you on a regular basis, uh, images, videos, and audios are introduced in a court of law. They have been for many, many years. Um, they are considered uh, legitimate evidence. What we have been seeing over the last decade or so is again this liar's dividend, that when there is an image or a video that um, is not good for a defendant or for the prosecution, they can simply cast doubt. They can say, well, how do we know it's real? And they can get the jury, they can seed doubt with the jury. I think in criminal cases, national security cases, civil cases, especially in the court, we have got to get more serious about how we introduce evidence in a court of law. Now, there are some technologies. So I've been talking about technology that authenticates after the fact, but there are technologies that can authenticate before. So these are so-called control capture cameras or software, where at the point of capture, when you record an image, a video, or an audio, you extract a digital signature, 
you cryptographically sign it and you put that on something like a blockchain that cannot be altered. And at that point, you can authenticate that content at any point in the future. I think police body cams, uh, CCTV, uh, and evidence that is introduced in a court of law should be required to use that type of content. And that way, when that evidence is introduced, we have a very strong mechanism for validating it at that point. Um, and if I can just uh, add on to this uh, for the German perspective, of course, digital evidence is a, plays a very crucial role uh, in many of the cases against foreign terrorist fighters that join ISIL in Germany, of which we have several hundreds ongoing right now. And just to give you a feel, because CP works with the team that investigates for the Security Council of the United Nations in Baghdad, um, war crimes against uh, that, that ISIL uh, uh, committed, how important digital evidence is, we've been supporting them on a court case um, in a European country where two identical twins were involved, clearly involved um, in the big uh, Speicher camp massacre where a thousand uh, Shiite recruits of the uh, Air Force Academy were executed by ISIL, but only one was, was visible in the video. So ascertaining which one of the identical twins was in the video and therefore could without a shadow of a doubt be convicted was a very, very crucial aspect because in particular this, this terror organization made sure that there were very few witnesses surviving any of its crimes. So even in Germany, um, digital evidence on a very, very important issue of national security is playing an increasing role. And I'm just waiting for the first defense uh, attorney to cast out on the Facebook profile or the picture or the video of, of the defendant. Um, I have a question for you, uh, Hani Farid. Um, you had shown deep fakes looked like they were not of the same quality than the originals. So there was the question, is it possible to create deep fakes in, let's say, HD quality like today's material? And a second aspect of this question, are your um, technologies that you work on also uh, capable to detect, um, let's say, um, cheap fakes, so Good. traditionally doctored videos like we see them today. Good. So I apologize, the, the quality of the videos you were seeing were lower because of Zoom. Um, we, you can render, in fact, HD quality uh, video and images of deep fakes with enough computing power. Um, to the second part of the question, the answer is, uh, there is quite a bit of a difference between deep fakes and shallow or traditional or cheap fakes. And so we have slightly different techniques. So I describe very specifically deep fake detection, but we have a large number of techniques that we have developed for detecting traditional fakes. And if I may, there was another question here that I want to answer, which is, you know, what is the danger of telling people how you detect these fakes, right? Because of course, you can see how my technology can be weaponized against me, right? Um, and so one of the things that we, we, and I struggle with this, I have to be honest, I think it's a very difficult question. And so what we do is we as academics and scientists publish technical papers to make what we do available to the scientific community, but we do not distribute the code, we do not distribute the data, we do not distribute the model, we do not make it available to the general public, um, or even to people who are creating deep fakes so that it cannot simply be incorporated. So the information is out there to move the scientific field forward, but we withhold some information to make it less likely that will be developed. And then the last thing I'll say is we also don't publish some things. I am able to do certain forensic analysis that we simply don't publish about 10% of the techniques simply to give us a defense against this very much of an arms race that we're in. Thank you. So um, we talked a lot also about like the technical things now. One big thing that I learned reading your publication is how important the distribution part is and really the role of social media platforms are in all of this. I, that was like a very big takeaway from, from me personally. And um, we have two questions concerning basically corporate responsibility. So one question was when you mentioned corporate responsibility to prevent the dissemination of deep fakes, how could it actually be done? on which legal basis can corporate responsibility be held? And then another question is that, um, how can we deal with this or can this even be dealt with on an international basis? Because I mean, social media uh, doesn't really care about borders and certain nation states seem to be 
proponents of this type of misinformation. Good. So how can we tackle this? Good. So let me start with the first question, which is, you know, wh where is the pressure you can put on Mark Zuckerberg and Twitter and YouTube? So here in the US, in EU and the UK, we are looking at regulations that say you have a duty of care. You have a responsibility that if your services lead to measurable harm, deaths in Myanmar, Sri Lanka, the Philippines, election tampering, harm to women who are portrayed in non-consensual porn, fake news that leads to the deaths of our citizens or disruptions of, of, of democracy, you are going to be responsible. And what you should know is that here in the United States, we have something called Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, which today says that the platforms cannot be held responsible for what their users do. Lots of good things come from that. Open exchange of ideas, vigorous debate, that's good. But these companies have taken that to an extreme where they will, for example, traffic young children into illegal prostitution and then say, we're not responsible, we're simply the host of this material. There are serious debates being happening on Capitol Hill um, at the D Justice Department to say you have a responsibility to make sure that your products are not being misused. The same way, by the way, that we hold all offline companies, airlines, food industry, automotive industry, anybody who makes a product has a responsibility. If their product leads to harm, they can be held liable. You can sue them and you can take billions of dollars from them so they don't do it again. We cannot do that with the technology sector and people like me think we should be able to. Obviously, you want to find a balance between an open exchange of ideas, vigorous debate, but we have taken that to an extreme where we've allowed the technology sector to weaponize technology against society, individuals, and democracies without being accountable. And the folks in the EU, the UK, and the US are starting to look at regulation that would force them to be more responsible. Now to the second question, it gets harder, which is there are no borders on the internet. And frankly, that is what makes all of this so difficult. So you can do harm in the Philippines that propagate to me here in the US or to you in Berlin. But again, I think that that's gonna need a combination of uh, the laws that I've just said, but every country is going to have to wrestle with this and understand that when they allow things to happen in their country, that it propagates the world. We now have a responsibility, not just to our citizens, but to the entire global community. So now we talk basically about how social media can do, can contribute to becoming better at this, to not send deep fakes out into the world. And there was one question that was directed to um, Mrs. Kemmer actually. And the question asked, in what way media, together with law enforcement and now building on what you just said, also together with social media, can collaborate, collaborate on this. So maybe I imagine one way to do this would be also to have like, as we already do, kind of like a fake news, kind of like detective on media. What about if like the New York Times goes ahead and finds out this is fake, what's on Facebook, and they go along and tag things as fake, instead of making it the responsibility of social media because they seem to not always be so willing. Maybe Dr. Schindler, you can uh, give your piece on that. Yeah, we, de we devote a little section in the report to, to that exact question. You know, it wouldn't just fact checking be good. Um, number one, there is of course a difference, a very big difference uh, in impact between forensic saying after the fact this is fake and actually preventing its harm from, from being done. When you talk about political manipulation, where you do not have days or weeks to react in particular, you know, close to elections or close to parliamentary votes. In addition, there's been quite a lot of statistical data that actually been done in research previously on, you know, the dissemination of lies um, online is that number one, they spread much faster and much deeper. Uh, and misinformation spreads much faster, much deeper because it's more and I tend to engage the audience with. Right? Um, than actual real news. And um, even worse, um, that fact-checking has a very limited impact on, on the harm that this information does. And in certain aspects, even amplifies the disinformation so that if you debunk it, you basically spread it again. So it's a very, very difficult issue to tackle with, but certainly fact-checking, while it has a role, cannot be a, you know, the major solution there needs to be legal aspect, uh, measures, there needs to be technological as, as 
uh, Honey said on, on uh, you know, detection technology as well as certification of original content to augment that. Um, the idea that we do have a free flow of, of, of uh, you know, information on the internet and you know, it will work itself out by counter speech uh, is simply not understanding how algorithms work. Right? Your lies, your disinformation get promoted up because it is more engaging rather than a debunking uh, piece of news. Hani, I think you also want to add something to that. No, I, th I think Hans said it exactly right that, you know, we, what would we like? We would like an open exchange of ideas. We would like a fair and balanced platform where we can talk about these issues, but that's not what we get. And the reason we don't get that is because social media is in the engagement driving business. They profit when you spend more time on their services. When do you spend more time on their services? Well, when they deliver you things that conform to your worldview, that's when you keep clicking. And it turns out hateful, divisive, sensational, conspiratorial content engages us. In fact, Facebook knows this because they've researched this and they know this, right? So we, we have to stop talking about this as if this really is the Oxford Debate Club. It is not. You are being shoved down a tunnel, whether that's a right-leaning tunnel or a left-leaning tunnel or a conspiratorial tunnel. They're all tunnels, right? And so we are not having the debate that we, I think, want to have about these things because social media is manipulating you to make their billions of dollars a year. And, and it is those algorithms in particular that I think we should focus on because the reality is, and, you, and I've seen some questions like, who decides what's real and what's fake? Who decides whether it's good or bad? And those are hard questions, and I don't think anybody has good answers, but we can at least agree that we should have a, the algorithm should be balanced, that the algorithm shouldn't drive you in some direction because that conforms to your worldview. I don't think that's good for us as individuals. I don't think it's good for society, and I don't think it's good for democracy. And by the way, that, that works for both the left and the right. The left is just as guilty of living in their filter bubble as the right is. So I don't think that it's a, it's a, it's a partisan issue. We have to engage with people that we disagree with in a more civilized and rational way. And the way we engage with social media today does, is not allowing that. I have a question maybe for both of you. Um, is it at some point in the future maybe impossible to recognize the difference between a fake video and a deep fake? And uh, how much time do we have left to find an effective approach to counter deep fakes? Yeah, I don't like predicting the future, but I will say there is an arms race. Um, the same way there's an arms race with spam and malware and viruses is that we get better at detection and creation gets better. Um, I can tell you probably how I think it's going to end up, which is that at the end, you will be able to create a fake that nobody will be able to detect, but it will be very difficult. It will be time consuming and there'll be risk associated with it and very few people can do it. So my job the way I think about it does not eliminate fake content. My job is to make it more difficult, more time consuming and take it out of the hands of the average person. So if there's a handful of people who in the world can do it, that's a risk. But I see that as a more manageable risk than the average person on the internet who can download some code and disrupt a global election. Yeah, and um, coming from the policy field to the technology field, I had to relearn, you know, I had a very conceived idea of what short, medium and long term means um, in the policy field, right? So short term, next month, medium term, next year, long term, three to five years. Um, that is much shorter in the technology area. I mean, any kind of regulation takes about three to five years, especially on the European Union to materialize. And I think the technological advances, if you just look in the last five years, as Hani has pointed out, you know, no one questioned the uh, Access Hollywood tapes as being fake uh, when they were actually published uh, to now where, you know, I think even Donald Trump said once now it is a fake uh, recording. So, and, and now, it, you know, you have a technological argument that may actually be true, um, whether or not that is up to everyone else to decide. So, I mean, the, 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 the timelines are not extremely short here. That's why we thought this report was necessary to do now when we do not yet have a, a you know, election in Germany where can we can point on and saying there was manipulation being done. There have been cases in the UK during the last parliamentary election, mind you, where deep fakes were used to actually influence the, the uh, re-election chances of 
some labor politicians very deliberately used shortly before the vote to, to screw that particular election in a different direction. So it's starting um, and Berlin being geographically where it is, I don't think that there is further to the east a great hesitation not also to try here. What I learned from uh, this discussion now and also from reading the publication before is basically we need what you already said, a multifold um, approach to all of this. It cannot only be social media, it cannot only be technology, it cannot only be policy. Um, it needs to be a package also of what Ronja Kemmer said earlier of educational measures. That's kind of what I take out of this and to, for all of us to be aware. Uh, unfortunately, we cannot answer all the questions that came in now. But maybe um, Hani and also Dr. Schindler, maybe there's some last words or things you want to say before I tell everyone again where to find this great publication. I'll just say a last few words. So first of all, thank you for the conversation. Thank you for the great, great questions. I think there are complex things facing us. I don't think they're easy. Um, but we have seen in the last 20 years, technology make remarkable changes to our society. Many of them very, very good. I mean, the fact that we can sit here today and I can talk to 150 people around the world simultaneously with video and presentation is a phenomenal technological innovation and we should be grateful for that. And what I see though at the same time is how that same technology and similar technologies are being weaponized against our society. And I don't think we should, we're not saying technology is bad, but we're saying we've got to start getting a handle on how technology is being weaponized against us as individuals and societies and democracies. And I think we can. I think, as you said, it takes a balanced view of things. It's a combination of sensible regulation, corporate responsibility, education, and just simply growing up a little bit as a sector. The fact is that the technology sector is very young. And I think it has been driven with the move fast and break things motto of Facebook. And I think we can do better than that. And I think we deserve better than that. Yeah, also, of course, thank you from my side for this wonderful event and, and for all the support we got through, throughout the, the duration of this study. Um, I just want to close with, with the argument that we at CEP, uh, as Hani, uh, are doing all the time, is that this is a mature industry. The guys running the industry may be young age-wise, but they're very mature when it comes to making money. This is no longer, I have a garage and I'm developing the Apple computer type of industry now, especially when we're talking about social media where a handful of platforms have you know, reached near global monopolies. And as this industry matured, it simply should be treated like any other mature industry where we are not condemning the industry and we are not uh, thinking the industry is saving uh, society here. It's just a technology that can be used for good and for bad purposes. And as with seat belts or airlines or banking transactions, um, we need this technology. But we also you know, should feel that we have the right as a society to decide what are the responsibilities of companies and not let the companies decide of how our reality will be shaped. Um, because as the study says, there is a staggeringly increase in the last five years of the consumption of news exclusively or primarily via social media in Germany. So it's no longer your television or your radio or even your print newspaper that shapes public opinion. It's majorly done now by electronic means. And therefore, these companies simply have to realize that they are no longer the garage shop that has, you know, rightfully at that time, and we're talking 20 years ago when, when Section 230 was passed, or the e-commerce directive uh, in, in uh, the European Union, which exactly stipulates Section 230 on the, on the limited liability. This is a completely different type of industry now. And as we have done with everyone else, um, I don't think it's too much for a society to ask that you keep your products from doing harm. Thank you so much for these uh, also explanatory words. So I want to thank all of you for being here today, all the attendees for listening to us, and of course, all the panelists for giving their inputs and for writing a great uh, publication. The publication you'll be able to find on our website after this is done. Does you understand? Maybe if it's not there right away, give it a couple of minutes and it will be up tonight for sure. And also the German version of the publication will be out in the next couple of weeks. Right now, the English version is uploaded or will be uploaded in a bit. 
And yeah, I'm happy. I know for sure that the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, and I'm sure also that CEP is happy to like keep engaging in this discourse with all of you, with each other. I think this is a topic we need to push forward and we will work on this, continue working on this. And yeah, um, hopefully with the contribution of all of you experts and interested people and also the people who are just interested in this topic, because as we said, education plays a big part of this. So thank you to everyone. And yeah, Hani, have a great day. Everyone else, have a great night. Thank and, you so much, uh, thank everybody. You so much. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you for the great questions. Thank you. Ciao. Ciao. Ja, da hat es einzige drin gewesen.